Welcome to this week's chapel at Boyce College and Southern Seminary. The preacher of the day is Dr. T.J. Betts, professor of Old Testament interpretation here at Southern Seminary. He joined this faculty in 2001, so we're talking about coming right up on his 20th anniversary on this faculty. He's an author, he's a biblical scholar, he's a gifted teacher. He's also known for local church ministry. He served in local church ministry in Kentucky and Indiana before joining the Southern Seminary faculty. He's married to Anne, and they have two children, Joel and John. Let's look forward to hearing from God's Word from Dr. T.J. Betts. If you will, please take your Bible and look to Psalm 3. And as you are, I'd like to uh, welcome you to this time. When my wife, Anne, is often going through a difficult time, and it's just become wearisome to her, she'll sit down and she'll say, it's just all too much for me. When we look to Psalm 3, we see a time in David's life when it was just all too much for him. He was surrounded by foes on every side. And even though he was a great warrior, the attacks of his foes were just too much for him to handle. And the Bible reveals that if you are a believer, you have at least three foes. What are these? One is the devil in 1 Peter 5, 8. The Bible says your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. A second foe every believer has is what the Bible calls the world, which is under the devil's influence. John in 1 John 5, 19 wrote that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And Jesus said to his disciples that if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world because of this world, the, because of this, the world hates you. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And a third foe of every believer is our own sin nature often called the flesh in the New Testament. Paul wrote, make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. And the flesh is those sinful desires in every area of our lives that run contrary to God. David gave in to his fleshly sinful desires and gave his foes an opportunity to rise up against him. And these foes of believers may arise in our lives when we make mistakes or sin like David did, or they may arise when we do what is right, such as in the case of Job or Daniel. Either way, believers must know that these enemies are constantly seeking the demise of every believer. David prayed the prayer of Psalm 3 when his foes had risen against him. And I'm sure that when he prayed this prayer, he wasn't thinking about us in our day. And yet, in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, Paul wrote that the scriptures is, it, it, all of the scriptures are profitable for teaching and training in righteousness. So what can we learn from David in this prayer? While we do not know for certain what the word Selah means, it often separates the sections within, this, within a psalm, and, and it does here as well. We're going to look at what we can learn from David and his foes in verses 1 and 2. We're going to look at what we can learn from David and his focus in verses 3 and 4. We will look at what we can learn from David and his fearlessness in verses 5 and 6. And we will look at what we can learn from David and his faith in verses 7 8, and 8. So if you will, look with me to Psalm 3. A Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. O Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God, Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. 
I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain, Selah. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. Selah. So what can we learn from David and his foes? We must recognize, first of all, that our foes are real. David didn't bury his head and say that this wasn't happening or act as if he could just go on with things because these foes were heavy upon him and the sheer number of them were crushing him and they were multiplying. And he's describing a feeling of being overwhelmed and helpless in the face of this onslaught. You may be feeling this way, besieged, overwhelmed, and helpless. A lot of people these days are feeling just those things in the midst of a worldwide pandemic, economic uncertainty, social unrest, strife, divisiveness, and isolation. That is not to mention the other challenges in our own personal lives and relationships. We too need to recognize our weakness. As Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. But the Bible doesn't teach that God helps themselves. Rather, it teaches God helps those who cannot help themselves. Isaiah proclaimed that the Lord is a defense for the helpless, a defense for the needy in distress, a refuge from the storm, and a shade from heat. In Isaiah 25, 4. The second thing we can, must recognize is the lie our foes tell us. Notice their lie here. They say here at the end of verse 2, there is no deliverance for him in God. Our foes want our sense of helplessness to turn into hopelessness. And that is why we put our focus on the Lord and where we put our focus is so important. And so what can we learn from David and his focus? Notice verse three, but you, O Lord, this little phrase shows the shift in David's focus. David recognized his foes were real, but he turned his focus to the Lord and realized he was not hopeless after all. You see, your understanding and perception of God indicates more about how you think and live your life more than anything else. Let me repeat that. Your understanding and perception of God indicates more about how you think and live your life more than anything else. When David looked to the Lord, what did he see? David saw his protector. Notice he says in verse three, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me. I grew up in Ohio and um, it's very much, I would call it a, a football state, a lot of football and a lot of football fans. And I grew up being a football fan. And I heard a story about a football coach that um, caught my attention. He was talking to a friend of his about the kind of players he wanted playing on his team. And the coach told his friend, he says, there's a situation where a player gets knocked down and he doesn't get up. And the friend said, well, you don't want him on your team. And then the coach went on and said, then there's that player who gets knocked down two or three times and gets up each of those times. But after that, he's not able to get up. And the friend said, well, you don't want him either. And continuing, the coach said, well, then there's the situation when a guy keeps getting knocked down over and over and over. But every time he gets up and the friend said, that's the guy you want on your team. And the coach said, no, I don't want him either. I want the guy that's knocking everybody down. Well, it may be that you feel like in life that you're being always knocked down. But you need to remember that if you are a believer, you have a shield and that shield is the Lord and he will protect you. 
from those who would knock you down. We must not forget this truth about our Lord. Also, David saw the Lord's glory. He says, but you, O Lord, are my glory. David remembered the vastness, the splendor, the majesty, the power of his God over all creation. Everything pales in light of God's glory. David was telling the Lord that the Lord mattered more to him than anything else. David realized the believer's victory is in the Lord. And we must remember this truth. Also, David, when he looked to the Lord, he saw his restorer. He says, but you, O Lord, are the one who lifts my head. When it's all too much for you and your head is hanging low, the Lord is the one who will restore you and lift up your head. It is this God, his Lord, who David cried out to, and it is this God, his Lord, who answered his prayer. And as a result of this, we see David's fearlessness. So what can we learn from David and his fearlessness? Well, look with me to verses five and six. He says, I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me round about. Before he was experiencing panic, now he's experiencing peace. Before he was fearful, but now he is fearless. Why? Because he shifted his focus to the Lord and prayed. When he did, he was able to rest. Why? Because he recognized that it was the Lord who sustained him. This means the Lord was his support. We must learn to lean on the Lord for support when life becomes too much for us. Are you resting on the Lord's support? Or are you anxious because you're trusting in someone or something else to protect you from your adversaries? Paul wrote these words in Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Thinking rightly about who God is and taking our concerns to God will give us a proper perspective and a perfect peace. So what can we learn from David and his faith? We can trust in the God who has already saved us to continue to save us. David remembers how completely crushed his enemies, uh, how completely crushed um, his enemies were by God when God had saved him in the past. Look at verse seven. He says, for you, you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. If you're a believer, have you forgotten how God through Christ Jesus has saved you? Paul wrote in Romans 8, <clears throat> he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will, be separ who, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. When the Lord Jesus Christ has saved us, he continues to save us and will always save us. That's why as we understand the teaching of what is justification and we think about salvation and all that's involved with that. We have been justified. We have been saved in the past tense, but we are being sanctified. We are being saved in the present, present tense and being made more like Christ. And we will be someday glorified when we see our Savior face to face and we will be made 
completely like him, complete and pure and right as he created us to be in Christ Jesus. And so salvation, as we look at the God who has saved us, we can trust the God who has saved us to save us now and to save us eternally in the future and trust in this salvation. And so when we look at David and his prayer, he remembered how God had saved him in the past, and it was that that gave him hope and strength in the present and for the future. We too must do the same thing. We need to remember what God has done in Christ to save us and how he saved us, and that this God who has committed himself to us will complete the work that he has begun in us and that he will continue to work in our lives and protect us. He will not take us in to throw us away. And he is faithful in all things. This is the God who David prayed to. And this is the God whom we pray to and whom we serve. Also, we notice here, he says, as he concludes, salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. This is the blessing of God upon his people. It is his salvation. The lie is that we are hopeless. Yes, we may be helpless and we may be weak, but we must remember that we are not hopeless because we have a savior and this savior is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we can trust in him completely. And the question I have for you this morning is this, are you looking to the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation in the present and for your future? Because as David prayed this prayer, this is our prayer as well, that when it seems all too much for us and often it really is, we can look to our God who is our shield, who is our glory, who is the lifter of our head. And we can look to him and his salvation and trust that he who has saved us will save us and our future is sure in a salvation for eternity. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this psalm. We thank you for the truth of it, the recognition that there are times in our lives when it does feel like it's just all too much for us. And yet, Father, we thank you that when we look to you, we look to our shield and protector. We look to the one who is our glory, the one who means more to us than anyone or anything else in this world, the one who is worthy of all praise. We look to you who is the lifter of our head, that when we see you, we realize that we are not alone and that we share in this victory because we are in Christ and we can trust you for help in times of need. Father, I pray that we would stand tall in the face of difficulties and do like David did and say salvation is of the Lord. And it is in Jesus' name we pray, amen. My guest today is Dr. Dustin Bruce, who is the Dean at Boyce College. And um, I've been looking forward to this conversation because the college is just one of the happiest things that uh, I've come to know in the entire work of Southern Seminary. And uh, Dustin, I'm extremely glad you're serving as dean. Yeah, I'm grateful for the opportunity. It is yeah. 
uh, just a joy, and we have a lot of fun, and I think we're doing a lot of good things uh, at the college, but it is, yeah. uh, I think, a singular blessing that I'll experience to serve as the dean of Boyce College. So I'm now in my 60s, and uh, meeting with my peers, friends, and uh, talking with people even at different ages, but you, know, you tend to kind of track with people your own age. Uh, we all agreed that most of us thought of our college years as just about the greatest years of our life. Just in terms of four years of an opportunity that's just never going to happen again. That's right. I think the idea of college education, residential, uh, undergraduate college education, is one of the greatest ideas human beings have ever come up with. Yeah, it is. It's fantastic. It's a, a great coming of age ritual, right, in right. our culture. And I think it serves that well, and uh, along with a, a number of other purposes. Um, right. it, it's great to be a part of it right. many years after my uh, given age to go through it. So. Right. You know, you know who you are when you're a child. You know who you are when you're in middle school and high school, but you're not sure in some ways. Um, but most college students graduate pretty sure they know who they are. And uh, so many things actually solidify and, uh, and, and come together, which from a Christian perspective uh, makes these years all the more important to us. That's one of the reasons why we didn't just establish a college, we established a Christian college right. and uh, a college uh, in which we're hoping to train up and uh, an army of young Christians who know who they are and what they believe and, and why they're here to go out and make a difference in the world. That's right. Yeah, if we think about right, Romans 12 too, and do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. And I think parents can sometimes think, well, that's true while my kids are at home and that's going to be true for them as adults, but maybe it, it doesn't matter as much when they're in college and they need this sort of yeah. American college experience that is less Christian than maybe we would like. And I think that's, it's such a wrong step, right? Because yeah. it is an instrumental time when students are uh, be, being exposed to so many ideas, rightly so, and figuring out who they are. Yeah. And uh, I love the Christian college environment because we get to shepherd that, right? According to God's truth and in His ways. So we have a lot of research. And, uh, you know, we're not saying this uh, over the heads of our college students. I want them to hear this. Uh, we have plenty of research indicating that the eight years of greatest risk uh, in young adulthood are the ages, the last two years of high school, then college, and the first two years after college. And it comes down to this. If someone stays connected to Christian faith, Christian church during that time, uh, they generally are lifers. Uh, but there's tremendous loss, there's tremendous risk at becoming disconnected with the Christian church. And, that, and I mean by that not just the church in its largest sense, but I mean a local congregation uh, being disconnected from Christian truth, uh, from Christian friends. Uh, there's a tremendous danger. And, and it really begins those last two years of high school when a lot of parents have no clue what's going on. And, and even a lot of young people they have no clue what's going on. They're, they're not, you're not able to track your heart that well. And, uh, and, and then you get to the college experience, which turns right in the middle of that and turns out to be absolutely crucial. And then the two years after that, which is when the largest percentage get married, they start their professional lives and all the rest. If that's established with Christian commitment, it tends to continue as a Christian commitment. Uh, exactly. And one of the things that we do is uh, we require students be active members in local churches. You, right. you can't register for classes if you're not, right. because we know we, we have four years generally to make that right. impact, but uh, you have to then launch out and, and begin another phase of your life, and you need to do so uh, as part of a local church. Yeah, that doesn't start later. No, no it can't. When I was a college student, I uh, was involved in Christian ministries on campus, and uh, that was very positive. But the most positive things I was involved with uh, happened in the context of the local church. And uh, they started throwing responsibility at me and on me. And I started having to do things. You know, uh, I preached my first sermon when I was, uh, I guess, uh, 17 years old. And uh, then the next thing you know, you're in charge of this. The next thing you know, you're in charge of that. And uh, the next thing you know, uh, 
you're exhilarated by this. And, uh, and then uh, the exhilaration of Christian truth. You know, the very same time I was beginning to ask these giant questions, uh, I discovered the intellectual riches of biblical Christianity. That's right. Yeah. We, one of the great things about what we do here, right, is that we uh, get to introduce students to this vast world of um, understanding all things Christianly. Right? That right. There is a, a Christian view of God and things. And we have a blast as a faculty getting to introduce right. that and see students right. light up, right, as, as the light right. bulbs turn on uh, often for the first yeah. time when they see Man, that it, this is not just a little part of my life, right. but my faith actually has to do with all of this. Right, and it's all interconnected. If you, if you just start to peel back the layers of the onion, you discover it's all interconnected. There's a, there's a theological reason why 2 plus 2 equals 4. Exactly. You know, and, um, and without that theological explanation, no one can actually explain why 2 plus 2 always equals 4. Exactly right. No, we... We have a, I think, a leg up in terms of the educational endeavor because we yeah. we can point back and say, no, we know exactly why two plus two yeah. equals four. It's because of a creator. So, what's the greatest fun you have in this in this in this job? What's the, what 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 is the the thing you get to do that uh, makes you happier than anything else? I think getting to spend time with students, getting to see them progress through. Uh, you know, certain milestones in their life is is the most fun, right? I mean, last yeah. night I was at a, a basketball game, just getting to cheer those students on, right? They know that I'm for them, right? Uh, because I'm, you know, yelling at the ref for them. So no, I. Uh, but that's just so much fun, getting to connect with them, encourage yeah. them. Uh, if they know that you love them and you're there for them, then yeah. they'll come to you when they need you. And so our faculty is committed to that, and it's such a joy. Um, to work with colleagues that are devoted to being there for students. And so that was an easy question. Here's a hard question. What's the part of your job you hate the most? <laughs> that is a, yeah, that is a tough question. I know the answer already, so you, <laughs> it, it's budgeting. Uh, emails, no. no yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I, I think the uh, one of the hard things is just yeah. you have to say no to a lot to say yes to the right things. Right. And so especially at a Christian college where we're committed to having a certain focus, uh, it takes a discipline and it takes wisdom to learn to say no so that we can say yes to the right things. Well, I, I uh, said that a little tongue in cheek, but no, no one enjoys the budgeting process. But it is just one demonstration of having to make choices. And it just reminds us every single year what we do, what is absolutely central, what, what's non-negotiable. And uh then we're, uh, we're going to be good stewards with, uh, with what the Lord gives us. But that's, right. that's actually a part of what has to happen in order for everything else good to happen. Yeah, of course. And it's a good reminder that you know, we are the stewards in some ways of a, a family's choice to send a, a student to that's us right. to invest uh, money into their education, and they're entrusting us with that. It's and got to be a good stewardship. That's right. It's a, a heavy responsibility that we ought to feel. So let me ask a dangerous question. Uh, what exactly does a dean do? So how do you know that you're deaning? I know that I'm deaning if, if the uh, academic operations are uh -huh. uh, moving forward, if classes are being taught, if mm -hmm. faculty are equipped and present, to teach those courses, if um, services are, are being offered, if, if student life uh, is occurring, right, just all of those things. If I, if I look out and see student uh, students being educated and, and also students growing in their faith because this is a Christian institution, mm -hmm. then I can go to bed at night feeling like I've deaned. Uh, yeah. Well, you are deaning, and I'm very thankful for you. And, uh, you know, I think students sometimes wonder what a dean does. From my perspective, on behalf of the institution, a dean's responsible to recruit and, um, and sustain faculty, uh, to assign faculty for the fulfillment of the curriculum, to make sure that we're teaching what we actually say we're teaching, and to make certain that uh, students are receiving everything they need to receive. And uh, that includes encouragement. And uh, the Lord's gifted you uh, to do these things, and I'm, I'm very thankful. Just to remind us about your family. Uh, married to, to Whitney uh, for a little over 10 years, and we have two daughters, Marley and Bella. So Marley's seven and Bella is five. 
and Precious they, family. Uh, they love being a part of the Boyce family as well. Yeah. It's such a, a privilege for them to be a part of it. And I, I tell them often that, you know, the Lord will, uh, He will judge you more strictly for the opportunity that you've had to grow up being a part of this. Yeah, well, uh, uh, those sweet little girls are the cheerleading squad mm -hmm. for Boyce they College. Yep. Yeah. Well, our great hope is to see Southern Seminary and Boys College continue in successive years, successive generations till Jesus comes in order that uh, young people not yet born uh, will be uh, trained, prepared, educated, and encouraged for maximum service to the glory of God. Amen. In that sense, Dean on. Thank you, sir. There I was, standing in an endless line outside of a nightclub in San Juan, Puerto Rico. We waited in line for what felt like hours to finally get into this nightclub. And as we were getting close to the door, the bouncer told one of my friends that I specifically could not enter into the club. I was a little bit shaken, I was taken back, after, and after inquiring, I was told that by my friend that I had to change my shirt Irritated because I thought I had a pretty nice shirt on, I drove all the way back to my dorm room, maybe a drive of upwards of 15 minutes or so, to change my shirt and to go back to the club. Now, I honestly don't remember anything else about that night, but what has stuck in my head all of these years was the fact that I was being singled out and rejected. And that hurt because I wanted to be accepted. I, I thought I was dressed fine like everybody else. I wanted the party like everybody else, but I couldn't. I was told, you are not welcome here. You are not accepted. We need you to be someone else or something else or you're not welcome here. And I, like everybody else, wanted to be accepted. Wanting to be accepted has been something that I've struggled with my whole life. The people from whom I have sought out acceptance have changed from friends to coaches to mentors, but one thing has stayed the same. I have desired the approval of others. Now, this has been coupled with the reality that rejection is inevitable if you desire the approval of others because some people simply won't reciprocate. So I felt like I've been persistently told, you're not good enough, you're not cool enough, you're not hip enough, you're not smart enough, change your shirt. We need you to be someone or something else or you're not welcome here. Some of this surely has to do with my personal background. Three of my grandparents were Puerto Rican and one of them was from Cuba. My parents met in New York City and I was born when my family lived in the South Bronx, the second of now seven children. When I was young, my family relocated from New York City to Lacey Park, Pennsylvania, where I lived for the longest period of my youth. And it was while living in that neighborhood, affectionately called the park by people that lived there in the 80s and the 90s, that two things happened that would change my life. Initially, my father, who was affectionately known as Sammy to his friends and loved ones, died when I was five years old, leaving my mother with four young children under the age of 10. I, I, I remember the pain in my mother's voice and in her eyes when she told, us, when she told me and my brother that, that our father had died. How was my mother going to survive? She didn't have a high school education. She never worked outside of the home. I remember the struggle that my mother went through raising young children on her own over the following years. I vividly remember all that she did for us and all the things that I'll never know, working outside of the home and inside of the home to provide her children with the best life possible. My mother also introduced us to who God was. Every single day of my life that I can remember, I believed that there was a God, that Jesus was his son. I believed that the Holy Spirit existed. But the belief wasn't personal in the sense that it did not affect all aspects of who I was. I knew of God and believed what I knew, but I don't quite think I can say I knew God. Secondly, while living in the park, I was invited to a Christian concert for the very first time in my life. Now, there's a bit of a backstory to this. While my family still lived in New York City, one of our family members that preceded us in a move to Pennsylvania become a belie became a believer in Jesus. And one day she was watching TV and a televangelist comes on. For some reason, she watches the show. She finds herself on her knees. She calls the number and prays to become a believer in Jesus. And from then on, she becomes an evangelist to the rest of our family. So jump ahead a few years and she invites me to go to this Christian concert. 
But this wasn't any concert. It was a week-long festival during which multiple bands played one after another. And in between the bands playing, evangelists shared the gospel message with the crowds that had gathered for the concert. Now, I don't remember on which day this happened. I don't even remember who it was, but one of these evangelists got up and shared from the stage the same message that I had heard over and over and over again. But this time, this time I understood it. Now, being self-aware here, I recognize that professors have a tendency to put the simplest concepts in the fanciest, theologically sophisticated, and maybe even sometimes nonsensical language. So let's not do this. Because what happened to me at that moment was so real that anyone could have understood it. So let me say this in language that anyone can understand. God touched me in a way in which I had never been moved before. All in the same moment, I realized that I was a grave sinner that I needed forgiveness, that I was forgiven, and that I was accepted, accepted by God, the only one who mattered, the only one whose acceptance mattered, God. He had brought me into his family. He set me in the family room and he said, you have a new family now. Here you are welcome as is. There is no need to try and be someone that I didn't make you to be. And these realizations took time to develop in my life. In fact, they're still developing but this was particularly difficult when I was in high school and college and started to realize that in a, in a sense, I was, I was different. Consequently, the reason for being so bothered by being rejected at the nightclub. For me, it didn't have anything to do with my shirt. For me, it had everything to do with not being accepted once again. But the only unconditional acceptance that anyone can ever feel while upon this earth is that of our loving Heavenly Father who accepts us, not because of who we are, because of what we do, but because of who Jesus is and because of what he's done. I know that I'm liberated from this satisfaction of the approval of others. Why? Because he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Will you pray for me that I would walk in this truth?